Wormwood, I'm very disappointed in your recent tweets. You say you are delirious with joy because political unrest in your patient's area has led to mass riots. I see very well what has happened to you. You're not delirious. You're only drunk. If I read between the lines in your very unbalanced posts about your patient's sleepless night, I can reconstruct your state of mind fairly accurately. For the first time in your career, you have tasted that wine which is the fruit of all our labors, the anguish and bewilderment of a human soul, and it has gone straight to your head. I can hardly blame you. I can't expect old heads on young shoulders. Did the patient respond to some of your terror pictures? Did you throw in some self-pitying glances at a happy past? Some fine thrills in the pit of his stomach? Well, well, it's all very natural, but do remember, Wormwood, business comes before pleasure. If any present self-indulgence on your part leads to the ultimate loss of the prey, you will be left eternally thirsting for that draught of which you are just now enjoying your first sip. However, if through cool-headed application here and now you can finally secure his soul, then he will be yours forever. A living chalice full to the brim with astonishment and terror that you can raise to your lips whenever you please. So do not allow any temporary excitement on your part to distract you from the real business of undermining faith and preventing the formation of virtues. I expect a full report at once of the patient's true reaction to the upheaval, so that we can decide whether it is your best bet to make him an extreme activist or an ardent conservative. There are all sorts of possibilities. In the meantime, I must advise you not to hope too much from this conflict. Of course violence is entertaining. The immediate pain and suffering of humans is a legitimate and pleasing refreshment for our myriads of toiling workers. But what permanent good does it do us unless we make use of it for bringing souls to our father below? When I see the pain and suffering of humans who ultimately escape us, it is as if I've been given the first taste of a great banquet and then denied the rest. It's worse than to have not tasted at all. The enemy, true to his barbarous methods of warfare, allows us to see the short misery of his favorites, to tantalize and torment us, to rub in that great hunger which in the current phase of the great conflict his blockade is admittedly imposing. Let us think, therefore, how to use, rather than how to enjoy, this unrest. For it has several tendencies inherent in it which are by no means in our favor. If we are not careful, we shall see thousands in this moment turning to the enemy, while tens of thousands who do not go that far at least are diverted from themselves to causes which they find more noble. I know that the enemy disapproves of many of these causes, but that is where he's so unfair. The enemy often makes prizes of people who have given their lives to causes he thinks bad on the monstrous ground that they thought them good and were following the best they knew. Consider, too, what undesirable deaths might occur in conflicts between protesters and law enforcement. People are killed in places they knew they might be killed and to which they go, if they are at all of the enemy's party, prepared. Much better for us if every human died in a costly nursing home, amidst nurses who lie, and doctors who lie, and friends who lie as we have trained them, promising life to the dying and encouraging the belief that sickness excuses every indulgence. And if our workers know their job, withholding even the suggestion of a minister, lest the sick man know his true condition. And how disastrous is that continual remembrance of death that media coverage enforces? One of our best weapons, contented worldliness, is rendered useless. Sometimes not even a human can think he's going to live forever. I know that Scabtree and others have seen in terrifying violence great opportunities for attacks on the faith, but I think that view is largely exaggerated. Remember, the enemy has plainly told all of his human partisans that their suffering is an essential part of what he calls redemption. So any faith that can be destroyed by simple suffering is not really faith at all. Of course, I'm speaking here of diffuse suffering over a long period. In the precise moment of terror or physical pain or bereavement, you might find your man temporarily without his reason. But even then, I've found that if he applies to enemy headquarters, he is often defended. <laughs>